గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ యాస్పిరెన్స్ వెల్కమ్ టు ది హిందీ న్యూస్ అనాలసిస్ బ్రాట్ యూ బై శంకర్ ఐఎస్ అకాడమీ టుడే ఐ విల్ బి కవరింగ్ ది హిందీ న్యూస్ ఎడిషన్ డేటెడ్ నైన్త్ ఆఫ్ డిసెంబర్ టూ థౌసండ్ ట్వంటీ టూ హియర్ ఐ హ్యావ్ డిస్ప్లేడ్ ది న్యూస్ ఆర్టికల్స్ దట్ విల్ బి అనలైజ్డ్ ఇన్ దిస్ డిస్కషన్ ఇన్ టుడేస్ డిస్కషన్ విల్ బి డిస్కసింగ్ అబౌట్ సర్టెన్ బేసిక్ కాన్సెప్ట్స్ విల్ బి డిస్కసింగ్ టు ఇంపార్టెంట్ బిల్స్ ఎక్సెట్రా అట్ ది ఎండ్ ఐ ఆల్సో హ్యావ్ అ క్విజ్ క్వశ్చన్ ఫర్ యూ సో లెట్స్ గెట్ టు ది డిస్కషన్ పార్ట్ నౌ So our first discussion is going to be based on this news article. First of all, I would like to request to our viewers to ignore the background noise. As you know, due to the cyclone, there is continuous rain in Chennai. So ignore the background noise. Now, look at this news article. It talks about a bill passed by Rajya Sabha. See, as you know, the winter session is going on in parliament. So we will be seeing many news related to bills regularly. Now on this list, Rajya Sabha has passed the Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill of 2022. This bill was already passed by Lok Sabha and now it awaits the assent of president. After that it will become an act. You know the process. Now this news article reports that the bill has been passed and also certain concerns have been raised in this bill. So in this backdrop we are going to learn about the new changes proposed by the bill to the Wildlife Protection Act. we'll also see one of the major concerns in the bill okay see as i said the wildlife protection amendment bill of 2022 aims to amend the wildlife protection act of 1972 now two reasons have been cited by the government behind the introduction of this new bill one is to increase the number of species protected under the law and second one is to implement the sites convention as you know sites stands for convention on international trade in endangered species india is party to this convention so india is obligated to take appropriate measures for enforcing the provisions of this convention and through this amendment bill this purpose will be fulfilled now let us come to the main part of this discussion which is the prominent provisions in the new bill see one of the major changes introduced by the bill is the changes to the schedules Currently, as you know, WPA 1972, that is Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, has six schedules. These schedules are for specially protected plants, specially protected animals, and these schedules also list the vermin species. What are vermins? They are the wild animals that are believed to be harmful to crops, farm animals, and which carry disease. So, currently, we have six schedules, but the new bill reduces the total number of schedules to four. How this is done is... earlier there were four schedules relating to the specially protected animals but now this is reduced to two so overall the number of schedules is reduced and secondly what you have to notice there is another change with respect to schedules the new bill aims to remove the schedule for the vermin species and in its place a new schedule has been inserted by this bill and this new schedule is for specimens listed in the appendices under sites okay that is appendix 1 2 and 3 and whatever is listed under the schedule will be called scheduled specimens now i also said that there is a schedule for the protection of plant species but there is no change made by this bill to this schedule okay so the first change is with respect to the schedules now let me come to the second major change it is related to the conservation reserves see as per the existing act section 36a and 36b deals with conservation reserves what are conservation reserves these are the areas that are adjacent to national parks and sanctuaries and also those areas which link one protected area with another so the main purpose of such conservation reserve is protecting the landscapes seascapes flora and fauna and their habitat and as per the existing act section 36a empowers the state government to declare a conservation reserve but the new bill extends this power to the central government also this is done by proposing an amendment to section 38 as you can see here this section empowers the central government to declare areas as sanctuaries or national parks but now next to national parks conservation reserve will also be added by this bill that means a power which was limited only to the state governments is extended to the central government in case of conservation reserves but what about community reserves see community reserve is any private or community land which is not within the national park sanctuary or a conservation reserve 
A community reserve is declared when a community or an individual has volunteered to conserve wildlife and its habitat. So, a community reserve is outside the national park, sanctuary, etc. And as per the WPA 1972, the power to declare a community reserve lies within the domain of state governments only. And even now, this power is with the state governments only. Central government has no say in it because the bill does not make any amendments regarding this power. So this was the second major amendment that is extending the power of declaring conservation reserves to the central government. Now what is the third one? For the first time the new bill aims to introduce provisions regarding the invasive species. See as per the bill invasive species are those species which satisfy two main criteria. One is it is not native to India and second its introduction or spread may threaten or adversely impact wildlife or its habitat. And such invasive alien species includes both animal species and plant species also. So for the first time provisions regarding the invasive species will be introduced by the bill. And the bill empowers the central government to regulate or prohibit the import, trade, possession or proliferation of such invasive alien species. Also according to the bill an officer will be appointed for this purpose by the central government and such officer will be authorized to seize as well as dispose the invasive species. So these are the three new major amendments proposed by the bill. Now let me take up the most contentious uh, provision in the bill. It is the amendment made to section 43 of the Wildlife Protection Act. This section 43 regulates transfer of animals. Actually the section prohibits the sale of captive animals, animal articles or trophy by the person who has its possession. But at the same time, when a person transfers or transports an animal, animal article or a trophy, but not for the purpose of sale, it is to be reported to the chief wildlife warden or an authorized officer within 30 days time. This means the act already allows transfer of animals. Now what the amendment says, it particularly permits the captive elephants to be transferred or transported and to be used for religious or any other purpose. As you know, elephants are a part of many cultural events of our country. So this provision will facilitate it. But then why it is criticized? First reason is elephant is a schedule one animal and it enjoys high protection. So the wildlife activists and animal experts are worried that such transfer and transportation allowed by the act will harm the animals. More importantly, as I said, such transferred and transported elephants can be used for religious or any other purpose. Here the term any other purpose is the problem because it seems to have limitless meaning. The activists fear that this would potentially increase the demand for illegal capture of wild elephants. And after their capture, they will be cruelly trained in crawls. What are crawls? See here you can see an elephant in a crawl which is uh, a small dark wooden enclosure. So the provision will lead to illegal capture of wild elements, their cruel training and it will also allow commercial trade of live elephants. And that is why the activists and environmentalists are concerned about this. So that is all regarding the Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill of 2022. We saw four major amendments. One was the changes made to the schedules. There are six schedules now. It will be reduced to four schedules. And the second one we saw was there will be a schedule for listing the scheduled specimens and these specimens are the ones listed in appendices of sites and then there will be no schedule for vermin species now on and then central government now has the power to declare a conservation reserve and fourthly there are new provisions regarding invasive alien species and finally captive elephants can be transferred or transported for religious or any other purposes these are the major amendments which we discussed today I hope in the coming days we will be discussing more contentious provisions in the bill. Now let me move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article it says Tamil Nadu is going to become climate smart state. Do you know what is meant by climate smart? That is what we are going to see in this discussion. See before seeing what is meant by climate smart or climate smart cities and states we need to know the need for it. As you know, cities often lack the capacity to quickly develop measures that respond to climate change. This situation leaves residents, especially those who are at the bottom of the socio-economic scale, vulnerable to climate change's negative effects. And this is where the climate smart cities become important. These cities are those which are built with infrastructure conducive to resist 
the effects of climate change. Other than this, these cities also have a mechanism of reducing its carbon footprint on the atmosphere. So basically, a climate smart city must have four features. One is having a proper green cover, second a good public transport system, third sound waste management strategy and fourth such a city must be resilient to any natural calamity. When a city is found to be good in all these parameters, we call it as climate smart city. Okay, so let me give you some of the climate smart cities around the world. First, let us take the case of Bogota and uh, Johannesburg. Bogota is in Colombia and Johannesburg is in uh, South Africa. These two cities have the best rapid transit bus lanes in the world. So this ultimately motivates the people to use the public transport rather than the private transport. Second example we can take is Singapore. Singapore has one of the best low cost housings in the world. But this scheme, other than providing best housing facility to its citizens, it also provides a climate resilient public housing. It is said that these housing uses similar structures which helps in reducing the overall heat island effects that takes place in an urban area. This is due to the fact that the rooftops are petal shaped and are properly ventilated which helps in reflecting back the solar radiation. Now, so while talking about climate smart cities, how can we forget the Scandinavian cities? Because these cities promote the use of bicycles among its citizens. And among all these cities, Copenhagen is the perfect example of a bicycle friendly city. So, all these measures are taken as part of being a climate smart city. I hope you understood what is it. Now, it is said that Tamil Nadu is going to be a climate smart city. Now let me take up this ad which mentions steering Tamil Nadu to a climate smart state. We just know saw what is meant by being climate smart. But leave that and look at this sidebar. This bar provides some of the important information that is relevant for prelims examination. You can find the important environment related current affairs in this bar. Yes. A new elephant reserve was announced in Tamil Nadu. It is the Agastya Malai. Then bird sanctuaries were announced. One is the Kaluveli bird sanctuary and Nanjarain bird sanctuary. And we also know that India's first slender loris wildlife sanctuary was also declared in Tamil Nadu only. It is situated in Kadavur. And Tamil Nadu also has the first biodiversity heritage site of our country. It is situated in Arittapatti. And India's first Dugong Conservation Reserve is also situated in Tamil Nadu. And a new wildlife sanctuary was announced. It is the Kaveri South Wildlife Sanctuary. And many sites were added to the list of uh, Ramsar Convention. I have given the Ramsar sites in Tamil Nadu here. You can just go through it. I just wanted you to know that all these sites are present in Tamil Nadu. Okay, this will help you in prelims. So with this information, well, let us move on to the next news article discussion. So let us see what this next article says. This news article talks about the Jalli Kattu case. And now the news is that a constitution bench of Supreme Court has reserved its judgment regarding this issue. I think you know that many petitions were filed in the Supreme Court seeking to strike down a Tamil Nadu law which protects Jalli Kattu. So what is it? Why they want to ban it? Let us see all these in this discussion. Let me begin with some basic details about Jalli Kattu. It is a traditional sport of Tamil Nadu that involves bulls. It is basically a bull taming sport. You can say it is similar to the Spanish bull fights and bull runs. Those who watch the Hindi film Zindagi Na Milegi Dobara, they know about the Spanish bull run. Am I right? So this sport is also something similar to that. Jallikadu traces its history to around 2000 years ago. It dates back to 400 to 100 BCE. The sport is seen as an event to honor the bull owners who rear the bulls for mating. Also in those days, it was conducted to select the most suitable bridegroom because the sport involves taming the bulls. So those who tame the bulls are considered suitable to marry. And most particularly, this traditional sport of Tamil Nadu is associated with a Tamil festival, Pongal. It is conducted on the third day of Pongal, which is called as Mattu Pongal. So what happens in this sport? For this, you need to know what this term Jalli Kattu means. It has two terms, Jalli and Kattu. Jalli means silver and gold coins and Kattu means tide. So what happens is, a bull is let loose among a crowd of people. 
so whoever tames it will get the coins which is tied to its horn so the people who participate in the sport try to hold on to the animal's hump to stop it and sometimes they even run along with the bull if they can tame the bull and get the coins they win but if the bull wins then the bull owner gets the prize and sometimes in this festival the participants get hurt many even die see not all types of bull are used for the sport there are certain breeds that are suitable for example pulikulam breed and kangaim breeds are used for this sport there is one more point here see the bulls which win in the festival are in high demand in the market so they fetch the highest price and these are the bulls that are demanded for breeding also now since the festival or the sport involves bulls it was banned in the year 2014 but why it was banned suddenly after so many years it is because in a 2011 notification the central government added bulls to the list of animals whose training and exhibition was prohibited so considering this notification in the year 2014 supreme court banned this bull taming sport of jallikattu supreme court also struck down the act which facilitated conducting of this sport it was the tamil nadu regulation of jallikattu act of 2009 So this move of the Supreme Court created a huge uproar among the Tamilians and there were many protests across the state. So the governor of the state issued an ordinance that authorized the continuation of Jallikattu. And after this the state government took another important step. It passed the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Tamil Nadu Amendment Act of 2017. Mainly this act exempted jallikattu from the prevention of cruelty to animals act of 1960 so this enabled the continuation of the sport jallikattu so these are the events that are related to the jallikattu issue now let me tell you why some want this sport to be banned the first and foremost reason is the animals involved in the sport are ill treated for instance it is said that to agitate the bull the bulls are fed alcohol they are even poked with sharp objects and even chili powder is thrown on its face so such kind of cruelty is said to be done to agitate the bull so this is the first reason why activists especially organizations like peta are demanding the ban of this sport the next reason is gambling see this sport involves a lot of money so it is said that it is going against the core objective of the sport which is bull embracing but there are also certain groups that support jallikattu it is my duty to give you the opinions of both sides but it is up to you to decide in an examination whether you'll be supporting the sport or you'll be against it okay now let me tell you the arguments by the proponents of this sport they want the sport because they see jallikattu as a chance for the farmers to flaunt their personal strength and the strength of their bulls and the love for their cattle and also to showcase how well they have looked after their cattle Secondly it is also said that jallikattu is a traditional way to find out the most potent bull to breed with their cows and also they say this helps the peasant community to preserve their pure breed native bulls so this ensures biodiversity and also acts as geographical indicator and fourth and most important reason given by the proponents is it is a tradition of the tamilians and it establishes their identity of hard work self sufficiency and power So they argue that it is a cultural heritage of the state of Tamil Nadu and therefore it is protected under article 29 clause 1 of the constitution. Article 29 deals with the protection of interests of minorities. And as per clause 1 of this article, the minorities have the right to conserve their culture. Now the fifth and final reason given is they say it also establishes a cordial man animal relationship because the owner of the bull treats the bull as a member of the family. So these are the arguments of the supporters of Jallikattu. There is also another sport in our country called Kambala. It is held in Karnataka. This is an annual buffalo race and it is also banned. The reason cited for its ban was the cruelty faced by the buffaloes during the race. But again here also an ordinance was passed to conduct the race and even Supreme Court interfered and advised the farmers to go easy on the buffaloes. and even advise the farmers to not use whiplash on the buffaloes and kambala is also seen as a tradition of the state so in case of kambala and also in case of jallikattu they are seen as their tradition and a way of protecting their native breeds that is why 
a ban imposed on jallikattu was seen as a ban on their tradition that is why it is taking a lot of time for the supreme court to decide on this issue because now it is also required to address the substantial questions related to the interpretation of constitution itself they have to decide whether it comes under the cultural heritage of the state under article 29 clause 1 or not now i have given the arguments of both sides this will help you to form a neutral opinion on this issue as an aspirant you should be able to do that so i hope my purpose is fulfilled here i have given you a comprehensive discussion on jallikat so with these informations in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion let us take up this news article now it says the maulana azad national fellowship has been discontinued see this fellowship offered scholarship for students from the minority communities and this fellowship was launched as part of implementing the sachar panel recommendations so are we going to see about the fellowship no we'll rather focus on the sachar panel recommendations see this committee that is the sachar committee was appointed by the then prime minister manmohan singh in the year 2005 it was headed by former chief justice of delhi high court rajendra sachar its main purpose was to look into the socio economic conditions of muslims in india so after looking at these conditions it prepared a report titled social economic and education status of muslim community of india this report presented a major finding which was muslims constitute 14% of the indian population at that time and they only comprise 2.5% of the indian bureaucracy so on a whole to improve the living conditions of muslims in india the committee gave 76 recommendations these recommendations were based on how to remove hurdles that prevent indian muslims from fully participating in the economic life political life and social mainstream of indian life to name some let me read out some of the recommendations the commission recommended to set up an equal opportunity commission to look into the grievances of deprived groups like minorities a bill was even passed to set up this commission but after that it was forgotten so as of now there is no equal opportunity commission i think i'm right then it also recommended to create a nomination procedure to increase the participation of minorities in public bodies more importantly it even suggested to work out mechanisms to link the madrasas with higher secondary school board it even uh, suggested to recognize the degrees from these madrasas for eligibility in uh, banking examination defense and civil examinations so like this many other suggestions were provided by this committee i have given here you can just go through it so overall the government actually accepted these 72 recommendations subsequently it even passed many policy decisions related to the education skill development for muslim youths in india but it is said that government's actions were mainly focused on improving the standard of education among muslims in india and this fellowship which we saw in the news was one of them so that is all about this sachar committee you can use these points in your mains answer writing whenever you talk about the upliftment of minorities because this is one such important panel that was focused on the minorities so with these points in mind now let us move to the next discussion so shall we take up an editorial for discussion if you would have seen today's newspaper you can say that it is full of election news only even the editorial page is filled with it so i have taken this editorial article that talks about far right ideology but why suddenly it is a news now suddenly it is a news because of germany see yesterday 25 people were arrested in germany in a nationwide crackdown these 25 people were accused of being part of extremist groups who were planning to overthrow the german state here the most surprising fact about this crackdown is these 25 people included a sitting judge a former commander of allied paratroopers and also a former police officer so many top officers of the country are said to be involved in extremist group and that is why they were arrested see the far right ideology is one of the major issues faced by many countries now therefore we need to know what is it and we'll also see the issues associated with it finally we'll conclude by saying what germany should do to address this problem before that note down the syllabus that is given here so let us begin with the big question of what is far right ideology it is an ideology characterized by anti democratic opposition towards equality yes it is a ideology that is a combination of two factors one is the anti democratic attitudes and the second one is 
protection of social hierarchies so here anti democratic attitudes means they are opposed to the theories or policies of democracy so this is seen as the extreme aspect of far right ideology on the other hand defending the social hierarchies is seen as the right wing aspect so because of these aspects the far right ideology is also referred to as extreme right or right wing extremism let me simplify it more so in this particular ideology the national community is defined as ethnic and exclusionary that is only those who belong to their own race belong to the people of the nation this is what they think that means the right wing extremists they believe that their people their nation and their so called race is superior to others and they are prepared to enforce this view by using violence also so this is the right wing aspect of this ideology or we can say the first aspect of this ideology thinking that their national community is ethnic and exclusionary the second aspect is extremism that is the ideology strives to overthrow the democratic system and wants to create a dictatorship because of these dominating elements we can say that the ideology is often associated with many other things like antisemitism racism xenophobia exclusionary nationalism authoritarianism and even conspiracy theories here i think you know antisemitism means the hostility or prejudice against jewish people and xenophobia is the dislike or prejudice against people from other countries So from this explanation about far right ideology itself you would have found many issues with this ideology it mainly produces a set of enemies these enemies are seen as a threat against the survival of their nation their culture or their race but the question is those who are termed as enemies are they really the enemies no because they are the immigrants ethnic and religious minorities those who are against racism fascism and also the left wing supporters are considered enemies by the right wing extremist people so this shows the conservative nature of proponents of this ideology and due to this conservative nature they also exhibit widespread contempt for other communities like lgbtq community feminists homeless people and even disabled persons another major issue with this ideology is they target a particular group of people see some of the most prevalent conspiracy theories on the extreme right identify jews and muslims as their key enemies so this has led to oppression political violence forced assimilation ethnic cleansing and even genocide against these particular group of people what is forced assimilation here it means forcing an ethnic community or religious minority group to adopt a particular language norms customs traditions etc etc of a larger community those who belong to dominant culture and this is done by the government itself this forced assimilation even includes the enforcement of a new language and legislation education literature and worshiping like what happened just before the sri lankan civil war ethnic cleansing we have heard it many times it refers to the systematic forced removal of uh, ethnic groups racial and religious groups from a given area here the intent is to make a region ethnically homogeneous in nature so based on all this if we even say that the right wing extremism is a politically motivated uh, violent behavior then it is also not wrong it is because the ideology justifies violent behavior within a democratic system We have examples from history that shows far right politics. Can you name one? It includes fascism, Nazism, etc. Yes, Nazism. It is a far right ideology and politics. So no wonder why Germany is facing issues related to far right ideology, right? But do you know Germany is a parliamentary democracy now? It is no more a Nazi country. Then what is the issue? The issue is there is rise of several far right networks in Germany. and these far right networks are having influence over serving members and retired members of the security agencies and state branches of germany so this has raised concerns for example we saw in the beginning that 25 members were arrested it is said that among these 25 members there were members of reichsburger also see this reichsburger is a label for several far right groups and individuals in germany These groups reject the legitimacy of the modern German state and they favor German Reich or the post-war German state. 
so in english we call this group as uh, raish citizens movement or the citizens of raish it is said that this group was planning to attack the bundestag and uh, wanted to bring down the government through a coup bundestag is nothing but the german federal parliament so by attacking the parliament they wanted to bring down the government and after that they wanted to establish a new empire modeled around the pre first world war imperial state and as i said the 25 members who were arrested included top officials of the germany but it did not go as planned rather it backfired as a result of which 25 members were arrested what you need to focus is all these reflect one main thing germany has witnessed the coming together of anti semitic extremists from various sectors of society for a longer time and these extremists are motivated by conspiracy theories and also a longing for a imperial era they are not worried about their group's actual strength and capacity but still they are prepared to use force to overthrow the democratic german state this is what is happening in germany so basically germany is facing two types of far right challenges one is posed by the extremist groups like reichsburger and the other is by the mainstreaming of far right politics that is the top officials of germany are involved in far right politics because of this only even last year the germany government partially disbanded its elite special forces unit called as uh, commando special krafti it is said that this partial disbandment happened after witnessing extremism within the highest ranks of this unit so the far right politics have invaded crucial arms of the government now how germany should tackle this issue germany is infamous for its horrific nazi past it has strong laws in place to combat extremist threats but despite its precautions far right groups are still gaining momentum so according to the author of the editorial article germany should make sure that the state institutions are not infiltrated by extremists otherwise they will bring down the government from inside itself and as part of this germany should also continue to suppress far right networks like reichsburger after this it should tackle the far right ideology politically this is how it should go according to the author of this editorial do you have any other ideas about how germany should act now post your ideas in the comment section so in this discussion we saw about far right ideology what are the issues in it we saw how germany is facing issues due to far right extremism and we can say it is going to be a tough task considering germany's nazi past So with all these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion Now this news article talks about another bill called as the Energy Conservation Amendment Bill So this bill was introduced yesterday in the Rajya Sabha So let us see some of the important provisions of this bill The bill aims to amend the Energy Conservation Act of 2001 and it wants to promote energy efficiency and energy conservation How see the bill seeks to establish carbon markets it also wants to enhance the scope of energy conservation building code it also wants to amend penalty provisions in the act and finally it also seeks to increase the number of members in the governing council of the bureau of energy efficiency this was the overview now as i said it wants to establish carbon markets but what is this carbon market for that you need to know about carbon trading What happens in carbon trading is governments set an overall limit or cap on the amount of emissions that are allowed from significant sources of carbon. That is there will be a limit on how much you can emit carbon. Here the sources of carbon would include the power industry, automotive industry and even air travel. What the government will do is it will issue permits up to the agreed limit. And these limits are either given free or even auctioned to companies. So here if a company controls its own carbon significantly then it can trade the excess permits on the carbon market for cash but if it does not limit its emissions then it may have to buy extra permits so here the carbon markets turn the emissions reductions and emissions removals into tradable assets here we can trade the carbon emission permits so what the bill says So the bill empowers the central government to specify a carbon credit trading system or scheme. The entities which are registered under the scheme can obtain carbon credit certificates from the central governments or any authorized agencies. Such entities are also entitled to trade these certificates. But remember the carbon credit 
cannot be exported it could only be used domestically but this condition is only until india fulfills its promises that were made at cop 21 and cop 26 okay along with this the bill also forces in some way to use non fossil sources of energy see under the energy conservation act of 2001 central government is already empowered to specify energy consumption standards now the bill has made some additions to this now the government may mandate the designated consumers to meet a minimum share of energy consumption from non fossil sources additionally different consumption thresholds may be specified for different non fossil sources and consumer categories but they may be mandated to meet this minimum share of energy consumption using non fossil sources but what if the consumer fails to meet the obligation then they will be punished with a penalty of up to 10 lakh rupees okay that is why i said the bill forces in some way to use non fossil sources of energy so overall through these provisions the bill promotes energy efficiency and energy conservation so in this discussion we saw some of the important provisions maybe in the coming days we'll see other important provisions from the bill with these points in mind now let us move on to the next news article discussion so for our last discussion let me take up this text and context article it talks about remittances according to the article remittances to india is set to touch a record 100 billion dollars in the year 2022 in 2021 india just received 89.4 billion dollars as remittances this data is according to world bank's latest release called remittances brave global headwinds but do you know why remittances are important let us find out now for that we need to understand the meaning of remittance simply it denotes a sum of money sent by one party to another but the context which we are using is the money that is sent by someone who is working abroad to their family back home in india okay but does india need it yes it is because it helps in the growth of country's gdp see the remittances that is the money that is received by the families are spent mostly on gross domestic products in their home country only that is in india itself so this helps in the growth of country's gdp other than that there are also other needs for such remittances for example it fulfills the needs of the recipients that is the families it helps them during their toughest times for example it is said that during covid-19 the remittances to india actually increased and these remittances also play a role in reducing poverty because the remittances reach the rural poor and using this money they improve their livelihoods increase their resilience and also achieve their goals but particularly if we take growth how does it happen using remittances see these remittances help in starting new small scale businesses so it fosters entrepreneurship how it is done because these money replaces the credit constraints which normally we face they need not look for credits from other financial institutions rather they can simply rely on these remittances and also because remittances are money it helps in giving better education and for having better health the recipients can easily meet their health needs and education related expenses which in turn helps in the growth of the nation so i hope you understood how it helps in the growth So now let's come to the question of the largest sources of remittances to India. Obviously the Gulf Cooperation Council countries are at the top. This includes UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, Kuwait. Apart from them, India also receives a considerable amount of remittances from USA and UK. But can these remittances turn to be negative? Actually yes. Because if they get large amounts of remittances, then it might discourage the beneficiaries from working. That is why it is said that the extent of positive impact of remittances depends on the income level of the receiving country. Okay. In this discussion, we saw about the basics of remittances and why it is needed and how it helps in growth. So, with this news article discussion, we are moving to the next session, which is the practice questions discussion session. Let me take up this first question. Which of the following is or are the advantages of carbon markets? First, encourages less carbon intensive lifestyle. Second, stimulates innovation. Third, enables green washing. See the carbon markets effectively encourage less carbon intensive lifestyle, right? Because you can trade your carbon permits. And obviously it stimulates innovation because more innovation will be done to bring in products or measures 
that will reduce emissions then what about green washing see green washing refers to a process in which companies falsely market their green credentials for example misrepresenting climate neutral products or services in the market so is this the advantage no it is the disadvantage of carbon markets so the correct answer to this question is option d 1 and 2 only now the second question i have taken this from prelims 2022 paper with reference to indian laws about wildlife protection consider the following statements first statement wild animals are the sole property of the government see actually this question was asked in prelims because last year itself the amendment to wildlife protection act was introduced in lok sabha so here upsc rather than asking about the amendment it stuck with the static knowledge about wildlife protection act so is first statement right yes it is correct because according to the act every wild animal other than vermin which is hunted shall be the property of state government and if such animal is hunted in a sanctuary or national park then it will be a property of central government and even in a word given by bombay high court it was said that wild animals including tigers should be treated as government property for all purposes so statement 1 is correct and here if you look the question also asks us to choose the correct statements only so you can eliminate options b and d now either 2 is right or 3 is right let me read out the second statement when a wild animal is declared protected such animal is entitled for equal protection whether it is found in protected areas or outside the statement is right because here the wild animal is declared protected not where it is present the act does not discriminate between animals found in protected areas and outside it just mentions that this animal is protected so wherever it is in india it is protected that is why statement is correct so the correct answer is option a 1 and 2 Let us also see third statement apprehension of a protected wild animal becoming a danger to human life is sufficient ground for its capture or killing see if a wild animal becomes danger to human life or is diseased or disabled beyond recovery then only it can be allowed to be captured or killed by the competent authority just mere apprehension or fear that a wild animal could endanger human life as mentioned in the statement is not a ground for capture or killing just because you are afraid of tiger you cannot say that it should be captured or killed but on the other hand if that tiger enters a human settlement and endangers human life then it can be captured okay now let me take the next question it is a pair based question on one side different committees are given and on the other side the recommendations of these committees are given first pair is hota committee civil service reformation this pair is correct only P. C. Hota headed the committee that was constituted in the year 2004. He was a former U. P. S. C. chairman, and the committee headed by him recommended that the age for entrance to the higher civil services should be between 21 to 24 years, and a relaxation should be provided to candidates belonging to O. B. C. communities, scheduled tribe, and scheduled caste communities. So, first pair is right. Second pair. Mulla committee jail reforms. Yesterday, I think we saw about uh, jail reforms in a discussion. This statement is also correct. It is related to prison reforms only. This committee even identified the rights of prisoners. Pair two is also correct. Now let me take the third pair. Balwant Rai Mehta Committee Center State Relations. This is incorrect because this committee gave recommendation regarding Panchayat Raj institutions. It is not related to Center State Relations. Since one pair is incorrect, you can eliminate option D. and since two pairs are correct you can eliminate option a also now fourth pair suresh tendulkar committee methodology of poverty calculation yes this is correct tendulkar committee is known for its recommendation regarding poverty estimation in india so three pairs are correct therefore the correct answer to this question is option c three pair only here i have given the quiz question for you go through the question we have discussed some of these sites in our past discussions already If you find the correct answer, post it in the comment section. Now let's take the mains practice question for today. Both are simple questions, but among them, one is a question that was asked in mains 2020. Try to answer these questions and post it in the comment section. Whenever we get time, we'll review your answer. So this brings us to the end of today's session. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment, and share, and also subscribe to our Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for getting regular updates regarding current affairs. I'll meet you all next week. Thank you.